the late chief, the paramount chief of Oba Herero, uh, he said that once, once he died, the, his bull must be put here. The German community here, they make an objection and then they remove that horns because they say that it's smelling. That Was it smelling? Ah, it's not smelling, but them, them, those rich people there, they, the Germans, they say, no, that thing is smelling, it must go off. It's racist, it's racism, it's racism. The injustices faced by Namibians today are inseparable from the country's past. Its most gaping open wound is what has been dubbed the first genocide of the 20th century. In 1904, German colonizers attempted to wipe out the Herero and Nama ethnic groups, massacring up to 110,000 people. So we've just walked through the German cemetery there, which is uh, very well tended and looked after. And just after it here, behind me, you can see all these mounds, which are the mark the graves of victims of the genocide. And then over in that direction, you have the German community's houses, which have slowly been encroaching. Essentially, they've been building over their graves. And then finally, you have this memorial sponsored by the German government, which quite incredibly says that the people who perished, perished under mysterious circumstances. I mean, adding insult to injury is really an understatement here. Prominent Nazis, such as Ritter von Epp and Eugen Fischer, were involved in the atrocities in Namibia. Von Epp is considered by many to be the ideological godfather of the early Nazi party. And Eugen Fischer was a pioneering eugenicist whose ideas inspired Hitler. He experimented on the decapitated heads of the Herero and Nama people to try to justify his theory of white supremacy. Both von Epp and Fischer were proponents of the theory of Lebensraum, or living space, that was central to Nazi ideology, a theory that justified land grabbing for the white race. And so historians say it was the genocide in Namibia that laid the blueprint for the European Holocaust. Now they want to take back their, their land, but if you, even if you go to some of the farms there, they are still having hero names. They are still having uh, Nama names, but they are, those farms are still being owned by the Germans, the children of the German settlers. While Germany continues to struggle with atoning for the Holocaust, its officials are still refusing to recognize German crimes committed against the Herero and Nama people as genocide. Meanwhile, a younger generation is growing impatient, eager to finish what the leaders of the anti-colonial liberation struggle started when they won independence from apartheid South Africa. Newer organizations like the Affirmative Repositioning Group, led by Job and Panda, are being formed to increase the pressure for land expropriation from whites, without compensation. So the project of liberation, of independence and the fight for freedom was therefore to, to bring about a new politics of emancipation that penetrates the entire of, of society. So the major contradiction was that the, the most of the problem that we face in post-colonial societies is that the independence is really an incomplete project. Namibia's independence had strings attached. Apartheid South Africa only agreed to leave on the condition that private property would be protected. The result was that millions of hectares of land would remain in the hands of the white population. The biggest sellout has been the neoliberal constitution that was adopted. It was an outward-looking constitution that ignores the history and suffering of our people. If you want to avoid a neo-colonial scenario, you must pay as much attention to economic liberation as you need to pay to political liberation. And neither we did it nor the ANC in South Africa. The political leadership of the former liberation movement, our ruling party, increasingly got comfortable with corporate power and, and with business elites. The government led by the Southwest African People's Organization, or SWAPO, which fought alongside anti-apartheid forces like the ANC of Nelson Mandela, has since repeatedly made promises of land reform. But Bernadette Swartboy, who was once the Deputy Minister of Land, says Namibians are getting fed up of unfulfilled promises. Now he heads the Landless People's Movement. We have fulfilled 
a Southern African leadership. We have a failed formal liberation movement leadership and young people are rising to the occasion to say, it's enough. You are too old, go home. We will take charge of things now. And many people are hearing this message and they are following. In April 2017, as part of an empowerment plan meant to reduce inequality, the Namibian government promised to introduce a bill that would make it mandatory for all Namibian businesses to be at least 25% black owned. Foreign investors, lobby groups and white landowners were up in arms about the policy. The government soon backtracked, ditching the clause and many of the more radical parts of the plan. You know, when Nzabe Ben Bugamba was running the country down and he was praised by the political leaders here, then you also would say, um, is it going to come here as well? But it didn't. You know, politics is an interesting thing. You know, you talk here and what you do at the bottom is different. For me, sometimes I wonder this gentleman, they all probably think these politicians are going to remain like that forever. If I was them, I would even just organize among ourselves that, that guys, this situation is not going to be like that forever. While white ownership of land never changed here after German and South African colonization ended, since the country's independence, the Namibian leadership itself has overseen the sell-off of the country's resources, like water, to Europeans. When you look at the migrant situation, where so many Africans are moving from African countries to Europe in search of a better life, it's a shame that a continent that is as rich as Africa today is, has a migrant problem. While the very countries they run to for a better life are the countries whose companies are making the largest profits in this continent. What a contradiction. As well as land, water, the most vital resource to sustain life, is a luxury that up to one third of Namibians endure a daily struggle to access. The country's supply is largely run by an international consortium made up of Germany-based Berlin Water International and French multinational Veolia, the world's largest supplier of water services. For many black Namibians, it's expensive and they have to pay in advance for water that often doesn't even come out of the taps. Working tips is around, uh, around about, uh, I think, four. Four? Four. So 20,000 are sharing four taps. You see here, zero, zero. But it, if, if you put in, it must register the amount. But now it wrote here, error. Some of the people are going there at the graveyard. They are going to steal water there. And that, that water is not healthy water. The water is coming from the sewage dam. I sent my son last, last Saturday to go fetch water. Mm -hmm. He went at 8 o'clock, comes back home by 12 because it's you, it's you, just to go fetch water. We drilled here and this supplies water here for the workers and for the main house. And the, this never, this is always no, water? This is always water. Especially at the house, it's very strong water. In the DRC, we met with Josiah and Pumwe, who invited us into their home, a small shack made out of scrap where they live with eight other members of their family. The memory of what German occupiers did to their ancestors still haunts them. The Germans came, all the whites came, to took all the men out, understand? Mm. So they were put on a ship, and this ship went into the oceans and then they disappeared. I mean, there was a blast, boom, like that, and that man never returned back. It's, it doesn't seem fair to me that descendants of people that uh, did that to your family or your mm. are still essentially living in, in luxury and, and, and you... You, you, you leaving me, me living in this... Mm. You... What should I say? Yeah? You can, you can see for yourself, you see for yourself how it is. You know if you were in you were me, you would also feel the same. Maybe they have to pay for us, for us to have a better living. As I said earlier, we as the descendants of those who died in that, in, that, in, that, in that ship. So what's the solution? There must be a solution. Or maybe we, I don't know, but there must be a solution for it. We can, they can just, just, just like that. There must be a solution. Mm, there must be a solution. Mm.
Black people are the majority in this country. They are the majority in whatever method. If they decide to occupy the land, they are going to decide to occupy land. There is nothing that the minority can do. We will take law in our own hands. That's what yes. we will do. Yes, but how, how would you do that? I will do anything. They can take me and go and lock me up. I will take it in my own hands. That's what I'm going to do. The white men might have left, but the legacies of white men remain. It remains in the imagination of self of the black people. It remains in the institutions of power. It remains in the education system. Young leaders like Ampanda, Peringada and Swartboy talk tough. They say that the inequality that colonialism brought to Namibia is impossible to end without radical change amongst the black population and confrontation with the white. There is no achievement that they came through you know, some liberal roses and flowers. We anticipate there's going to be opposition and antagonism to our struggle. Blood was shed for us to get independence today. Violence is inevitable. For me, violence is inevitable. Uh, what happens when dialogue fails? In Europe, you will see a white man mm. driving a bus, mm. fixing something or building a house. Here, white mm -hmm. people, mm -mm. Blacks will work for them. Mm. He receives the money. That's the thinking that has fossilized mm. in the white man's mind. Blacks are weak. They are afraid of us. We can do whatever we want with them. And their leaders are also afraid of us.